We always believe that 4 millimole of lactate equals in aerobic threshold state RQ1. That is not the case. So the question is, okay, super confusion now. What do we do? Yes, speed is the only, only thing that counts ultimately, but you have to approach it the right way. You have to understand what a certain speed means for the body at a specific point of time. Because ultimately, that body needs to be able to get the internal capacity to produce energy in, in such an efficient way that the given speed is attainable without getting into overtraining. And for me, the ignorance of that simple fact I just stated is the reason why many teams have a lot of people in overtraining. And then the so-called talents are the ones, talents, who simply survive that rigid training regime. The fittest survive? No. No. How come huge nations don't have all the medals? It's how you train your athletes. It's not how big a nation is, it's what you do with the people you've got. Why many teams have a lot of people in overtraining. So, you do a lactate test, and you think that lactate test will solve all the issues in the world because now you know exactly where to train. And the answer is no, it is not true. So with this video, I want to talk a bit about training planning because this is actually my core competence. This is what I do. A lactate test is such a substantial part of everything that I would like to talk about nitty gritty details you probably should know if you're serious about training and lactate testing and all that stuff. So let's start the video off. Why do we even need a lactate test? Well, you could use heart rate, you could use perceived load, um, and you could use lactate to understand whether or not the current speed you're going at a certain intensity level is correct or is not. So I'm a big proponent of actually going by speed of watts. That's the ultimate measure. How fast are you going? But the second ultimate measure for me is what does it mean for your body? And I, I've talked to a bunch of scientists and whenever I ask them, say, what is the most reliable way? If you could measure everything in the world, you had all the equipment there is and every single training you can do this, money, no object, what do you want to do? Um, is there a way to get a proper, reliable answer and say, okay, this is exactly um, the thing I need to know that you are exactly in the right training zone right now? And th the answer is no, <laughs> there is no such thing. So the question is, how do you solve this issue? Ultimately, nobody knows. Nobody has a clue whether or not you're in the right intensity zone all the time, and that all the time is what counts. It's not like you have one perfect training and say, oh, that training today was perfect. Who cares about one perfect training? What counts is, you know, how many good trainings do you have where you are in the right intensity zones? Before, so when, when you make a plan, that's one thing, but knowing that you are in the right zone, that's a whole nother thing. And to come back to the topic, if, if you measure a heart rate, now heart rate has its ups and downs. Um, or pro and cons to be precise. The pro of heart rate is everybody can measure it. If you don't, if you need no device except a stopwatch and you count, that's about as reliable as, as getting the super fancy watches that can watch, then they can monitor everything. Seriously, and it, it doesn't really matter. A heart rate is heart rate, and the more the more training hours you've got, the more reliable you will be able to tell your heart rate without even measuring it, and you will probably be quite accurate. You know, one option is to look at heart rate and say, okay, what is your maximum heart rate? Oh, your maximum heart rate is, I don't know, 200. Then there's there are formulas and you subtract, um, sorry for me laughing, but it's, it's, it's funny. So you subtract uh, so and so many points per age and whatever the moon says and you do this and that, and then you end up with your heart rate zones. And this is usually never accurate, never. Um, I do have a formula as well, but that it's one that I developed based on, I don't know how many hundreds, uh, probably a couple thousand lactate tests I've done. And it, it works completely, it, it's quite different. So the way I developed it is that I simply did a lot of correlations between what is, what is the lactate and uh, what is the heart rate and who's the athlete. And that's what's interesting for me. So the other option is perceived load. It's super accurate. I like that. What does it feel like for you today? And it takes into consideration your overall state. It's not like, hey, I can do, uh, I can do 200 watts and it usually feels fine. What is fine? So you, you say, okay, there's a scale of one to six. 
And six means devastatingly hard. You can do a scale of one to 10. I just go by one to six. And um, I have 0 0.5 increments. So six is so hard that you don't even know how to how to handle that. And one is a walk in the park. And you say 200 watts usually is, a, I don't know, a, a 1.5 to a two. And today, for some weird reason, it feels like a three. That's a clear cut signal. So your body's telling you, hey, buddy, 200 watts are pretty hard for you today. Now, your heart rate may still be the same, but your perceived load says something else. Um, so what should you respect? And the answer is both. Monitor, it's an alarm signal. The third parameter I like to use a lot, if possible, is lactate. You can go without lactate measuring, certainly, and be successful. But if you can measure, I think you should. And lactate simply is, well, lactate is the thing. <laughs> I, I keep it super simple. Lactate is a byproduct of muscle contraction. And it's super, super simple. But it's also used to recycle byproducts of the muscle contraction and turn them back into energy the muscle can use. So lactate is something that is being generated, but also reused. And therefore, there is no such thing as a lactate steady state. It's a hypothetical thing, but not a real thing. Lactate either becomes less or becomes more. It never stays the same unless for a couple of seconds or a minute or so, but no more than that. So when, when people do a lactate test, they usually do a step test. So they would say, okay, uh, we hit, we start with 100 watts. Let's say 100 watts is my usual super easy pace. Good, you do 100 watts. And then usually people do four minutes and then take a break of one minute. And it's not like you need a rest. You usually need some time to tack lactate. But if you're experienced, it takes you maybe 20 seconds. So I, per I personally prefer to do more than four minutes. I prefer to do six minutes. That's the least I recommend to do. Because if we, if you want to have something in the proximity of lactate steady state, you're much closer at six minutes than at four minutes. So I take the six minutes because it also takes into consideration However many watts you pull, you better be able to pull them for six minutes, not four. That's, that's a different animal. You know, trying to pull, I don't know, 400 watts for four minutes or 400 watts for six minutes, that's a different thing. You know, it's 50% longer. So it, it is interesting. In an ideal world, I, would, I wouldn't even do step test. I would just test as we do the training. This is what I usually do quite on a frequent basis. And then you do 10 minute intervals or stuff like this, which is pretty reliable. But again, it's not a perfect world. So you do that lactate step test and then you find out, okay, uh, you did 150 watts at two minimal and uh, 100, I usually do 20 to 30 watt increments. So let's say 180 watts was 2.5 and 210 watts was uh, 3.5 and um, 240 watts was 5 point something. You say, whoa, we need to work in the latter areas. There's, uh, there are quite some deficiencies. Now, if you have somebody who's had a lot of milk before you do the test, forget the results. It doesn't mean anything because what we measure is lactose, like lactate. And if you bring a lot of lactose into your system, uh, good luck getting reliable results. It just doesn't work. So um, next thing, if somebody uh, had a very high intense training the day before, forget it. If somebody ro rode um, her or his bike to the lactate test, trying to go real hard because it was fun, forget the test, it's not gonna work. Um, if somebody has deprived themselves of carbohydrates um, the day before and has had a lot of water, the results are gonna be excellent, but, uh, but, but utopious. So you're gonna have low lactate with high watts. It's not about whether or not being good, it's about finding the right intensity zone. So you better be doing what you always are doing. So eat about one or two hours before practice, don't ride your bike too hard. Ideally, don't ride your bike at all. Um, and do a neutral training the day before. I like to work around 0 0.5 to 2 millimole of lactate. That is a reliable measure where you say, okay, you always do the same thing and da da da. So now you know um, the result is actually something that is a good representation of what that athlete actually does at certain watt levels. The good thing about lactate is that it's, unless you know what you do, it's very difficult to cheat. Uh, heart rate, you're nervous, boom, 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 your heart goes up. Um, perceived load is actually quite accurate, but if there are outside stress influences, this will change your perceived load as well. So yes, it does have a physical impact, absolutely true and legit, but at the same time, lactate has got this bit of a neutral touch to it. 
most people believe the four minimal threshold is the anaerobic threshold. And that is pretty far from the truth. It is simply not true. What we, are, what, what we actually want to know is what your RQ is. And the RQ is called the respiratory coefficient. And that is essentially a comparison of the gases you take in versus the gases you take, you, you, you um, exhale. So inhaled gases versus exhaled gases. And if that reaches a proximity of about one, you know um, your body is just on the brink of changing from aerobic work to anaerobic work, the way energy is being produced for muscle contraction. So in other words, this is about where you will tap into the zone of anaerobic threshold or anaerobic work. Anaerobic without oxygen, so something's gonna change um, relating to the gases you inhale versus the ones you exhale. So that is done with, um, with, with a mask, with an oxygen mask. This is how you measure that stuff. But the thing is, you cannot always have this. And there are companies working on this, but at the same time, we don't want to work on the right where the anaerobic threshold is all the time. And now comes something quite interesting, that ominous four millimole um, anaerobic threshold level, that's not a true correlation. The anaerobic threshold is not just different from person to person. So one person could have the RQ1 at 3.5 or three, and the other person could have it at seven. And there are even some more extreme cases. We always believe that four millimole of lactate equals anaerobic threshold state RQ1. That is not the case. And it even varies from person to person from day to day. So one person could have the RQ1 at, at, at I don't know, 3.5 and the next at 4.2. It is not the same. So the question is, okay, super confusion now. What do we do? And the thing is, get the least, uh, get the lesser of all evils. And this is why um, I did a video about my training zones. And I said, this is, this is a reason why I personally came up with 11 different training zone systems. That is when I decided, okay, I cannot, I cannot really use sports science literature because all of that stuff has been, you know, all the, all of these studies have been conducted with sports students, not pro athletes. So forget about it. This, in, in a pro rower is a whole different animal than a sports student. No matter how fit this person is, forget it. It doesn't compare. So you, nothing, what, nothing about the stuff you usually read say this is how you do hypertrophy and this is how you do this it just doesn't work it does not work the way it works with normal people and rowers aren't normal it, they, they simply are not the thing is we cannot know possibly whether or not somebody's actually in the right training zone or not we can assume we can check with heart rate we can check with perceived load we can check with lactate but do we know no the trick is in 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 it's not like I'm giving away a secret, but for me, this is really the trick. To always target two, one, two, three intensity zones within a training to give, to give the body quite um, distinctive discrepancies in the intensities we target so that the body starts to economize to many different things that are all in a closer proximity. And what I want to achieve with this ultimately is that the body's able to work in aerobic energy production mode and pull very high watts. This is the ultimate goal. This is why I do all of that. And since I have 11 different training zones, I can always play the piano up and down and up and down. And I'm probably in the lower areas and if, if we're about 12 months away from peak of season, that will gradually increase, but keep everything in the pack. And that allows me that I, I'm, with my athletes to a larger extent in the right training zones than others who always stick with one intensity and that's what there are no secrets in training planning but if there's one thing that could be considered to be a secret that is one of the secrets simply be more in the right training zones than others that's all that is required and if i see you know how, how some people target their intensity zones with I, you know, so and so many percent of the world's best time is going to be your low steady state and nonsense like this. I call it nonsense intentionally. My apologies. This is simply weird stuff. Um, let me explain what this is so that you know what I'm talking about. So there are actually charts um, where people say, okay, the world's best time in your world class is this and this. 
And in low steady state, a stroke or tone, so my calculation, whatever it is it's based on, says that you, athlete XYZ, should be at 87.125% of that. And if you're not, you better work hard. Because all that counts is speed. And I'm making fun of this because it is a joke. It doesn't work this way. Yes, speed is the only, only thing that counts ultimately, but you have to approach it the right way. You have to understand what a certain speed means for the body at a specific point of time. Because ultimately, that body needs to be able to get the internal capacity to produce energy it's in, in such an efficient way that the given speed is attainable without getting into overtraining. And for me, the ignorance of that simple fact I just stated is the reason why many teams have a lot of people in overtraining. And then the so-called talents are the ones, talents, who simply survive that rigid training regime. The fittest survive? No. No. How come huge nations don't have all the medals? It's how you train your athletes. It's not how big a nation is, it's what you do with the people you've got. Okay, ladies and gents, I hope this wasn't too confusing. I, I sincerely hope it wasn't. And uh, let me know what you think. I'm looking forward to your comments. I would love to read them, I always read them. I'm slow in responding, but I love to read them and I always I always take into consideration for the next videos, okay, like, hey, what they read here and there, what, what are people asking? And I would love to get your opinion. And if there is anything I should clarify more or do the same video all over and explain it in a different way, just let me know. With this being said, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for subscribing. I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to buy a real workshop. I will do some workout myself now. Go to armtraining.com if you want to work with me and be part of the team and get your own personal training plan. And I'll see you in the next video. Subscribe. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.